So good afternoon. Um, this paper is actually prepared by Asha Sharma, and she was a postdoctoral fellow at Cornell and did this work on climate impacts in India. Um, unfortunately, Asha got stuck because her U.S. visa is running into some problem. Uh, I guess the Trump effect has started, <laughs> <laughs> and so she cannot travel and. So like any good postdoc, she assumed that her professor would know everything that she was doing. <laughs> so she sent me the paper and said, present it. Now, <laughs> I, can, I can guess what she has said in the paper. So I, you have to take what I say with a big grain of salt. Because I, I know the big picture, but I think the technical details will be a little bit difficult. So the first set. So some of these uh, bigger picture climate issues you've already heard, so let me get past all of them and go straight to where we need to be. So one of the issues that comes up when you think about <clears throat> climate change models and the IPCC projections and how do Indian policy makers deal with them? So when you think about it in that context, then you find that you know most of the IPCC models are actually focused on a few crops. They're focused on rice and wheat and maize and few other crops, but they don't focus on many of the the vast majority of crops that have that are important to the poor, particularly from a nutrition point of view. And also, the, the models focus on larger regions. So from a policy perspective, it's hard to then say, what does this mean for, for us, and what kind of action should, should India take in order to, to sort of protect itself from the climate change impacts that are happening, or to create corrective action. So, when Asha Sharma started her postdoc work, um, so we talked about, you know, can we get estimates of climate impacts at a much more disaggregated level? Can we get estimates at a district level? And can we look at crops beyond just rice and wheat? And then to look at, you know, whether is it temperature and rainfall that's important? Among the two of them, which one is more important? And are there some extreme uh, uh, events that also play an important role? So these were some of the broader questions that we were asking in the postdoc program that she started. And so here are some of the results that come out. Um, so one, one thing that she found as she started to address this issue was that most of the, the global models um, work with having worked through uh, physiolo plant physiological models. And most of the plant physiological models are very limited to a few crops. And so there's no physiology models that look at millets and pulses and other crops. So that once you think about can we expand the set of crops, you immediately run into that problem. And second problem you run into is you don't, even if you did have, even if you did want to expand your crop modeling, the technical coefficients are not easily available in order to adapt crop models to particular, to crops that are not covered through the usual IPCC domains. So the next way to handle this is to actually do statistical models. And so to take district fixed effects models and, and basically run uh, statistical regressions with temperature and precipitation and look at yield impacts, doing it as fixed effects, looking at um, the district uh, differences, and, and try to do it district by district across the country. And so she spent a lot of time doing that and, and doing it across all the crops that were important in that particular district. 
So when you when she did that, <clears throat> she came out showing that when you use the fixed effect models, there are few Indian crops that stand to benefit from climate change, which means pretty much all the crops have a negative impact of climate change, both from temperature and precipitation point of view. The few crops where there was a moderate increase were also not statistically significant. Uh, so most of the crops where you had a statistically significant relationship were for with a negative relationship. And you can see that here, through her work, she's been able to move beyond the main staples and look at various other crops in the food system in India and how climate change affects them also. Now, this is kind of an interesting slide. When you, when you try to plot the regression results, <laughs> you kind of say, there it is. And so you look at it and say, so what exactly are we talking about? So, but what you are talking about is you can, even in that blob, you can make some judgment uh, of what's, you know, what's the, the cutoff levels, the thresholds at which you see high risk happening. And so she was able to say, at a certain temperature threshold, at a certain precipitation threshold, that's when you would see the highest risk for any particular district. So she was then able to, to look for each district, identify the risk threshold for temperature and precipitation, and then use that data to work through on the impacts of climate change. And so having done that, she came out basically saying that that more area will be under threat from extreme events. And so the, most of the discussion that happens uh, is on gradual rise in temperatures uh, or gradual fall in precipitation, whereas her work shows that the impact of extreme temperature events, the impact of extreme uh, precipitation events would have a larger area-wide effect now when you look district by district. And I think that's an important finding in terms of focusing attention on extreme events and not just looking at long-term trends per se. She also shows that there's significant seasonal differences. So for, uh, there's this, a geography to season interaction here that the more global models may be missing out on. And she shows that the Karif season, which is the wet season, uh, would have a stronger temperature effect in the northwestern part of India relative to the rest of India. Whereas in the dry season, the temperature effect would be much stronger in the southern part of India relative to the the northern part of the country. So these seasonal differences make a big difference in terms of the policy of mitigation or adaptation that you would target at a more disaggregated level, at a district level, or at a state level. And so the, the, and part of it is also trying to understand the probability of hitting extreme events. And she, she shows in her work that those extreme events are also related to which geography you're talking about and which season uh, for that geography you're talking about. Let's see. Now, this is particularly important because if you're ever in India in the month of July and you read a newspaper, every newspaper in India in July is going to say the monsoons are late. And the monsoons are laid, therefore we, our crop is going to be affected by so much and we'll see 20% drop in yield production, et cetera, et cetera. And this goes on. By the end of the year, you find that actually there hasn't been a big drop in production. The production continued to be just fine. And so she wanted to look at this, this situation and see why you have this thing happening. And her results, though not surprisingly show 
that the, the date of the onset of rainfall has very little to do, up to a point, with what happens to final yields. But the length of the rainy season is the more important factor. So where the length of the rainy season continues to be high, Makes sense. right? But the, the narrative is always around the onset, on the first day of rainfall and how late it is relative to the first day. And so the other interesting part of that work is she shows that where investments are made in irrigation and input use, that effect of rainfall onset is much more limited than where those investments are not made. So if you look at the figure on the left side, which is irrigated districts, you find that in the case of the irrigated districts, you do see this very nice relationship between length of the season and the yields that come out. Whereas in, in the districts, sorry, in, in the less irrigated districts, you see that relationship between length of the rainy season and yields. Whereas in the, non, in the irrigated districts, you don't have that relationship because irrigation protects you from that weather-related variability associated with rainfall. So investments in irrigation is one way in which you can adapt to some of the, the extreme events that climate change can bring about. So let me bring this all back together. So the big conclusions that come out of her work were that just the focus on just the two big crops leads to an incomplete picture of the agriculture nutrition impacts on climate change. And that crops that are at most risks, um, especially those important to the poor, need to be included in the analysis looking ahead. And it's not easy to do, obviously, because of the not having the crop models and all of that, but that's an area where I think developing countries should be investing a lot more of resources to address these issues. Um, again, there's large variability in the the pathways, the climate pathways that are chosen, and the results depend a lot on what pathway is chosen. And there's also a large uncertainty about the climate models themselves. And the results vary dramatically based on, on what climate models are chosen. Um, access to inputs, especially to irrigation, makes a big difference in terms of adaptation to climate change. Uh, there are regional and seasonal differences in climate challenges. And the perceptions of the importance of some climate events are overblown compared to their actual impact. And that's where the slight delay in monsoons comes in. Um, and she also finds that while precipitation will likely still be a concern, seasonal temperature extremes uh, will become even more important over the long term. And finally, climate variability in terms of extreme events and higher incidence of extreme events, and not just climate trends, need to be tackled. Okay, with that, I shall stop here. Thank you very much.